All right, so uh, should we get started? Uh, so uh, welcome to this uh, uh, Tuesday session of the uh, workshop in Fluids and PD. And our first speaker is uh, Professor Peter Constantin from Princeton University. And uh, well, if, Peter, if you can put your slide, I don't have you. I don't have a, a title for your talk in my, in hand here. Uh, the, my talk is about hydrodynamic pressure. Can you see the the screen? Uh, no, uh, you, I have a, your second transparency here, but it's okay. So the, the talk so is the first, the the, talk is, is hydrodynamic pressure. And wait a second, wait a second, it, uh, because that means it doesn't move. So, okay, so do you see now the title? Nope. All right, so uh, one moment. Because that's the exactly problem that I we anticipated. Do you see it now? Okay, now we have the, the the first the first slide. Okay. Okay. So the title is hydrodynamic pressure. So the title is hydrodynamic pressure, and well, uh, it's it's your microphone, Peter. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I remember previous long time ago, not so so long time ago meetings in Brazil. It was a great pleasure. Uh, it's uh, good to see or be in the same virtual room with everybody um, and hope for the, a better future. Meanwhile, let's talk about this talk. I'm going to talk about hydrodynamic pressure. I'm going to give two different applications or, or uh, uses of the pressure. Uh, the first one is to give conditions for absence of blow up or conditions for blow up in Euler and Businesk equations. This is work, uh, recent work with Dongo Che. And the other is to give some results on basically on steady Euler equations, but uh, in the guise of magneto hydrostatic uh, equation. Uh, and this is uh, recent work with Dan Gisberg and Theo Drivas. So uh, they're very different in nature, but in uh, both of them are essentially based on the pressure. So the pressure is a main character. So uh, we start with Euler and Navier-Stokes, and actually you can think of the whole talk as being about Euler. So the Euler equations is a conservation law uh, for, uh, I, I took uh, density to be one, so it's uh, for a velocity or, or a momentum, but now it's a velocity uh, that's divergence free. And the stress is uh, the, are given by a pressure. So uh, you can see my cursor, I hope. And also feel free to interrupt. I mean, it's a, it's a pity that we are so isolated, but really feel free anytime to just interrupt. So unmute yourself if the host lets you. So um, the stress tensor is made of isotropic pressure, pressure times identity matrix, the quadratic expressions ui, uj, and the deformation uh, the rate of strain, which is uh, called also the deformation tensor, which is the gradient of u plus gradient u transpose. If you take the divergence uh, of this uh, equation, and the divergence commutes with the time derivative. So therefore you have a time independent solution. So uh, the divergence uh, equation gives you the equation for the pressure and everybody knows this. So uh, minus Laplace of the pressure is the gradient of U dot, the divergence of U dot grad U. And if you use incompressibility, if U is uh, divergence free, you have, you can express this either as the trace of the gradient square or to pull out two derivatives and it's two derivatives of the U tensor U. So this equation, if you are in a bounded domain and you are, you are thinking about it, it's really an equation for a projector and there is no real boundary conditions. <clears throat> the pressure is also defined up to a free, possibly time dependent harmonic function as you see here. And the equation doesn't see the viscosity. So it's the same equation for all. 
Um, I uh, thought about this equation for Navier-Stokes. We're not going to talk about Navier-Stokes today, though, some older results. So um, we are going to talk about Euler first. So in the whole space, you can represent the solution uh, using uh, this last representation of what your right hand side. You can invert Laplacian formally, and you get this expression. And then you get a non local expression that's quite um, explicit. So let's talk about uh, the Euler equations. First of all, the pressure why is the pressure important? Well, the pressure is the force. So um, in Lagrangian uh, variables, and we're going to recall what are the notations here. In Lagrangian variables, uh, Newton's law, which is uh, acceleration equals force, is written like this. So the acceleration of a particle, the particle is denoted x of a and t, a is the label at time zero, and t is time. So the acceleration is balanced by the forces, and the forces are the gradient in Eulerian language uh, of uh, the pressure. So if you have a time evolving domain, this simply says that the rate of change of the momentum in that domain is balanced by the pressure, and that's the normal to the domain, exterior normal to the domain, on the boundary. So it tells you the flux of the pressure nor in the direction of the normal uh, balances the rate of change of the momentum. And the rate of change of kinetic energy is also balanced by the pressure and the flux, the normal flux of velocity. So uh, definitely uh, everything uh, that happens, happens due to the pressure. So Euler equations are um, important because they're, they're uh, essentially the basic nonlinearity in all fluids. So it's well known that smooth solutions conserve energy, uh, kinetic energy. Uh, they conserve circulation, which is a concept that I'm not going to describe here. They conserve helicity, which is also something I'm not going to talk very much here. And um, blow up of smooth solution with finite energy is not known. So again, think a little bit of the pressure. If you write the Euler equations and forget to write the pressure, you get Berger's equation, and that blows up. If you write the Navier-Stokes equations and forget to put the pressure there, you get Burgers with viscosity, and that doesn't blow up. If you put back the pressure, you don't know either one of these statements. So known results for the uh, Euler equations are some blow up infinite energy solutions of stagnation type. That means there is a point that doesn't move. Um, imagine the origin is uh, a zero of the velocity. And then under some ansatz about the behavior of the solution nearby, uh, a bunch of people, J.T. Stewart, uh, Childress, Early, Spiegel, uh, Young, John Gibbon, Focus, During, and Okitani, and myself, found proofs of blow up. But uh, in this case, is the energy is infinite. So, uh, for instance, uh, Nansat is of the following type the velocity has uh, three components, depending only on, let's say, horizontal variable x and y. Uh, but the third component, uh, has a z in front, okay? So that's the vertical direction and they're very slender vortices. So uh, uh, this is a consistent ansatz. Uh, the z equals zero axis invariant as a move and you have a blow up, finite time blow up, but it comes from infinity. It comes from some secret compression. Uh, Tarek el uh proved um, recently, well, relatively recently, that uh, C alpha with small alpha axisymmetric solutions without swirl uh, blow up. These are, uh, there is a certain anisotropy that, that comes out in this proof, and it's a, a remarkable result, but it is uh, not going to carry over to smooth initial data because uh, smooth axisymmetric solutions without swirl do not blow up. So uh, there is a long story about numerics. Uh, people have been looking at this for decades for the blow-up problem, not only uh, the Euler equations in general, there are hundreds of years. Um, that's not, uh, let's say, conclusive. There are a number of uh, numerical results that are uh, the recent ones of Tom Howell earlier by, by uh, Bob Kerr 
And the basic mechanism for blow up is a vortex stretching mechanism. At the boundary, again, it's a certain anisotropy that, that uh, makes it a little more dangerous. So alignment of vortex lines opposes the blow up. And uh, now I'm uh, frozen. Okay, I'm sorry about this. I'm gonna stop, share and start again. Oh no, it uh, woke up. So blow up requires an underlying uh, geometric singularity. So uh, that means that if you have um, a singularity, a parent singularity in which the vortex lines become aligned in the limit uh, just before the blow up, actually that singularity cannot occur. So uh, you need some sort of a breaking of the smooth structure over which the blow up occurs. And I draw here an X, so you have a crossing of vortex lines. So it is known by Beal, Kato, and Maida that blow up at time t occurs only uh, if the magnitude of the vorticity uh, is not integrable in time up to time t. So there is a infinity obtained in integral in time. So, and the geometric depletion of nonlinearity is a statement that if the direction of vorticity is smooth in regions of high vorticity, then uh, the Euler equations require infinite vo velocity to blow up. So they have to send the blowing up region out of, uh, you know, to send it to away very fast. Uh, and the Navier-Stokes solution is smooth. So what's uh, uh, this condition was uh, the smoothness or it's Lipschitz actually uh, was improved by a number of authors a long time ago and even localized and uh, even proved with some boundary, uh, mostly boundary conditions for Navier-Stokes. But vortex reconnection is uh, what I think is the, I said this before, so let me repeat this. It's at this point, this is conjectural and physical argument, but vortex reconnection as a regularizing mechanism. So the story is the following. You have strong coherent vortices. Coherent means that they're intense and they are uh, distributed in tubes. And uh, as uh, the vortices become stronger and stronger, they stretch and become intense, narrow vortex tubes. It's, um, there's pictures of spaghetti like that in numerical things. So the tubes try to approach at various angles and thus violate the smoothness assumption on the gradient of direction. And then the viscosity has, there is an a priori bound that tells you that the gradient of psi needs to be in some average sense bounded where the vorticity is large for fixed viscosity. So uh, that says that the viscosity opposes this uh, curvature, if you want, uh, singularity. And uh, what happens is that there is a viscous mechanism in which the vortex tube become anti-parallel, reconnect, and then uh, things decay. So events like this have occurred several times. This is all what I'm saying here is speculation, uh, but uh, this, uh, I think it's both observed and hard to prove. So if you replace, uh, as you see, I, I said that Navier stokes are smooth if this is smooth, and this is a very averagey kind of information about the gradient psi, if you could upgrade that to smoothness, then you have a theorem. Um, we don't know how to do that. So oh, I'm gonna talk about the Euler equations. I'm gonna, uh, I'm sorry about this very busy slide and we're gonna come back to this busy slide a uh, number of times. So uh, this is a slide with a notation. So the, we saw before the map, uh, this is a Lagrangian path map, uh, and uh, its definition is that it's a diffeomorphism or uh, transformation that obeys at each label the ODE given by the velocity. So material derivative is denoted capital D sub T, and material derivative of a function composed with a, a transformation is the regular time derivative of the control post. So we have here the decomposition of the gradient into half uh, the deformation tensor. So the one half gradient U plus gradient is the symmetric part and the anti-symmetric part. The anti-symmetric part is really the vorticity. So if you look at this matrix, 
in 3D, this vertex, this matrix has components zero and uh, vorticity uh, minus, uh, you know, on each line you have two components. And the action of this, this uh, matrix is just omega cross. So omega is the vorticity. So the vorticity equation is the material uh, derivative of the vorticity is stretched by S as the vorticity equation and S itself has an equation. And in this equation, there is a material derivative of S is S square plus J square, this J plus P. So J square is a projection perpendicular on the direction of vorticity multiplied by the magnitude of the vorticity squared with minus, J square is negative. J square would have been positive, things would have been more dangerous. So S square is positive, J square is negative, trying to balance this. And P is uh, the object of our study next. P is the Hessian of pressure. So the coherence, so these are uh, important uh, uh, objects. So we're gonna talk about this P next. But before I do that, I remind you, we had that statement of co <clears throat> the depletion of nonlinearity. That one is based on the fact that uh, the magnitude of vorticity is amplified by uh, an object alpha, a scalar, and this uh, scalar is related back uh, to magnitude of omega by a geometric factor. And this geometric factor vanishes when psi and psi uh, at x, x plus y uh, are parallel. So it's a determinant here. So because of that, there, there is one more term there, but it doesn't uh, matter to this talk. So when when uh, the vortex lines are parallel, this thing eats up the singularity. And that's uh, how you prove uh, that uh, coherent vortices don't, don't like to blow up. So let's go to uh, conditions in terms of capital P. So please, for a little while, I'll come back to this, but this is the S equation. And in S equation, I have um, this P that is uh, the Hessian of the pressure. So the first thing is a blow up result. So you see here, I have a positive thing. I have then a negative thing and I have the pressure that I don't know. So the statement is obviously, if the matrix P is non-negative in a weak vorticity region carried by the flow, then there is no, there, there is blow up. So this is a very old statement. I don't know if my ears are correct here. It's probably earlier. Never mind. So here is a simplified version because I couldn't actually find uh, uh, this uh, Physica D online easily. So I read, prove it. So, and this is um, on a single trajectory. Suppose you have a, a, uh, a label and T a time of uh, some form of coherence. You'll see it in a second. And the coherence properties that I require is first that the vorticity is bounded and the pressure Hessian is not negative on the trajectory up to time t. So that means I assume there is a number omega that bounds the magnitude of vorticity on this trajectory up to time t. And I also assume, which is a little generous, but I, I will, uh, that this Hessian is non-negative. So as a matrix, so that means for all vectors uh, or along, the same trajectory, so for time t. And then you start uh, with a strain matrix that has one negative enough uh, uh, eigen direction. So you can put, uh, obviously the strain matrix has a trace zero. So if it's not identically zero, it will have uh, a negative uh, direction. But then you require that the magnitude here is a sufficiently negative compared to this bound. And you can arrange this very easily because you can take regions of zero vorticity at where you are and zero vorticity is carried by the flow. So it's not really a, a restriction to have uh, the strain matrix larger than the magnitude of vorticity. The, the, um, the restriction is because omega is a bound for all time on that time interval and not only the initial one. Uh, let's uh, see uh, the conclusion. The conclusion is that blow up occurs unless the coherence time, this t, is small. So it's smaller than the log of this bound. Uh, remember that you can arrange this to be like of the same order. So this is of order one. 
And this can be in principle large. So you can say that it, uh, it's a very, very uh, nice theorem that you may, may actually make it into a theorem. But the truth is that the problem is in the relationship between initial omega and this capital omega, uh, that is not controlled. So uh, if you assume a linear relationship, then of course uh, you are in great shape, but there is no such thing. All right, so that's a, a simple result. And uh, let, me, let me return. This is a result that says if this is positive long enough, and this is weak compared to this originally or for um, some time compared to the duration of time, then this thing beats everything else and there is blow up. I'll come back and show you that the proof is very easy. So the two results we don't go uh, are the following. There, um, bear with me a little bit. It's a little hard to write at first, but it's interesting. So. You assume that you have a solution that's smooth up to some time, uh, which uh, is in encoded in having W2Q, Q larger than the dimension in three dimensions. And uh, you assume a certain quantity to be finite. And uh, let's look at this quantity. So you take two unit vectors, zeta and c, and you take the pressure Hessian uh, apply to one of them dot and t to others. So you take this component of the pressure Hessian, you take the negative part and you assume that that negative part uh, is in absolute value and supremum uh, integrable uh, in this fashion. And then, then you have regularity. In particular, although it doesn't look obvious from here, if you have a blow up, that's the, if you do dimensional analysis, the blow up should be uh, like t to minus two. And if uh, the, let's say, type one blow up constant is less than one, then there is no blow up. And this one is obvious. So now uh, the notation again, the two vectors, the first vector is the direction, C is the direction vector, and zeta is uh, the stretching direction vector. So the first vector is material. So this, if you start in a region that uh, vorticity is not zero, that region is material. So because of this, if zero uh, initially, you are going to stay zero. However, the, the other one is not material. The other one is the direction of the stretching. So it's the direction of this vector. So uh, you could uh, have uh, this vector being zero. Of course, in that case, uh, there is no growth. So uh, the regions of interest are when the, the vector is. Uh, so uh, as a theorem, we assume that uh, whenever this is not defined, uh, you put zero in this expression. So it's all, all correct. So um, this is a, a, a little bit surprising. So let me make some comments. First of all, obviously, this is less than the norm of the matrix point-wise. So in particular, if you have this uh, condition, <clears throat> that this integral is finite, then uh, you don't have blow up. And uh, similarly, if the rate of blow up of the L infinity of this is less than one, you have no blow up. So, and we are using only one part of the... So why is this a little bit surprising? Or if you go back to the equation or to the, the blow up, uh, you see that conditions, qualitative conditions of P alone, lead to blow up, whereas this is a, a quantitative condition that, uh, that rules out blow up. In particular, there are models. And again, the here, here, maybe it's 80s actually. Um, there are classical models uh, that the VFOS model is simply a local version of the S equation in which you remove just the trace of S square. Uh, and my model was, I called the distorted Euler equations at probably in the 80s. Um, and uh, that is simply the S equation. If you take this S equation, you change this uh, capital D sub T to partial DT, but still use the relationship that we had here. So this relationship means you use the representation of the pressure. P is R I R J U I U J. So if you use that representation of the pressure, you can uh, get an expression or in terms of the trace of S, actually the other one, the trace of S squared, and you have uh, a closed equation 
here, where P is defined uh, like in Euler. So the only cheat you do is you replace capital DT by partial DT, meaning you're not advecting, and then that blows up. So uh, it is uh, quite remarkable that um, that is re restoring and the uh, advection uh, puts in a situation in which that is not automatically true. So this is the, the story uh, about these things. We can do Boussinesque as well. So, oh, sorry, uh, I told you I'll be surprised. Uh, we localize this also. It's not a <clears throat> very difficult result. You can take assumptions uh, in a ball. Uh, notice, however, that the ball doesn't change. So you assume for a short time, close to the blow up time, that the velocity uh, is bounded. By the way, this kind of bound is true for Navier-Stokes globally, um, but it depends on viscosity. So, uh, and you assume the same kind of uh, conditional integral for only along uh, in the neighborhood of the point x naught, or you, its consequence, the same thing is a consequence here. I'll explain in a second why it's a consequence. And uh, then you don't have law. So let's uh, uh, explain why it's a consequence. If uh, this condition is satisfied and close to the blow up, uh, you have that this object is less than some small number times the negative power of t minus uh, tau, whatever it is. Okay. And then you integrate once, you get a small number, uh, number less than one time to the power t uh, times t minus s to minus one. Oh, but that integral is a log. And it's going to be a log with a power less than one. So uh, the exponential of the log is going to be the power. And the power is less than uh, one. So it's integral. So that's, that's why this implies that. So it looks that's why the exponential integrability of this uh, object, although you would be tempted to say, forget about it. Uh, let me just ask that this is integral. That's really, really, really much uh, worse than asking this whole exponential integrability by one order of magnitude, and that's that's a uh, thing. So we can do this for 2D Boussinesque. Actually, it's interesting to think about all the models that we don't know blow up for in 2D. Uh, not all of them have this uh, Newton law structure, or at least if you insist on a Newton law, it might not be uh, conservative. So uh, Boussinesque is, has a Newton law constraint. The force is uh, gravity acting uh, in one direction proportional to this theta and the gradient of pressure. Divergence theory is zero, I didn't write it. So <clears throat> this is 2D Boussinesque. And again, it's one of those models that we don't know blow up for. So you have, because this is an active scalar, you have the analog of the vorticity is the rotated gradient of theta. And so therefore its direction is this normalized guy. Again, it's a well-defined. And this is really the stretching if you take the the gradient uh, of uh, the second equation, you get exactly the stretching equation, uh, the vorti quote unquote vorticity equation for, for uh, gradient part theta. So this will be the stretching. So the theorem looks exactly the same, except there is a T minus T in front. And therefore uh, the power here is two instead of one, because as I argued just before, you pick up here a power that will be uh, less than, one and then negative one and then they're they're going to be integrable so they localize this one and the localization is exactly the same if the velocity doesn't tell you to go uh, far out of uh, your region in finite time uh, and the local condition holds then uh, the solution is regular up to that time so these are the results. You can try other equations. The main point, and I'm going to talk about it later, the main point will be uh, a natural equation for the analog of vorticity. We'll come back to this later. Let's see how I am for time. So I'm, I'm good, I think. So I'm, I'm going to go and talk about uh, the second subject. Second subject is best understood in the context of um, the fusion program. 
So um, plasma is a mysterious subject, really. Um, but magnetohydrostatics is um, essentially um, the statement that the magnetic field and the current are balanced by a pressure in the absence of a velocity. There is no velocity u. Divergence of the uh, magnetic field is zero. In J, the current is the curl of B. So you have a dictionary. So the vorticity in Euler is what J in the plasma, and B is what uh, velocity was. The pressure is written differently, and that's uh, you know that's traditional. We are not going to uh, mess with uh, this condition. There is a plus here, and it's on the right hand side, and, and so. For the Euler, people who know Euler, this is the negative of the uh, pressure that I talked about up to now, plus u square over two. So in the Euler case, this is a well-known important minus the minus. It's an important quantity pressure head in fluids also. So this is steady Euler. The plasma problem is uh, motivated by constructing devices that keep uh, plasma, uh, hot plasma, in essentially long enough uh, inside. So uh, the problem is to construct in a domain T. Sorry for the same the names are going to be local in with a slide. So T is the name of a toroidal domain, and you have boundary condition non-penetration, like in Euler, uh, at the boundary. So you are looking, however, for steady states. And you are looking for certain steady states, quasi-symmetry. We're going to discuss it a little bit. So tokomax and stellarator. So the pressure, the reason why this is a this pressure, but it's really related to the previous pressure, uh, is essential. If you have a non-trivial pressure, then you have two vector fields, uh, j dot j dot grad pi uh, is zero and b dot grad pi uh, is zero. So therefore, there are um, essentially there is no foliation because you have a level sets of pi, uh, and there are two vectors that are uh, 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 parallel to it. So non-trivial pressure is needed for confinement, and actually there is a great mystery about what are the constraints. What we're going to talk about essentially is trying to produce shapes t and solutions that have certain properties that are not even described here, but the, the, uh, the properties are the properties that are needed for confinement. So in particular, the tokomax have a T to being a standard torus, and then solutions can be, um, for mathematicians, easily produced. Uh, and uh, however, those are very unstable. And one of the reasons for the instability is uh, the large current and um, large current drives the plasma to the walls, so they have to turn it off and so forth. So you need non-trivial pressure. Now, Beltrami solutions, which are solutions in which the curl is parallel to B, so this is zero and there is no pressure, uh, definitely don't have any confinement properties. So you don't want Beltrami. So it's a classical result uh, by Bruno and Lawrence um, that proved that you can do piecewise Beltrami. So you can put together Beltramis. They become weak solutions with jumps. So the jump, the pressure is a step function jump. So there are current sheets uh, in between, uh, and they uh, can be constructed by Kosciuszko-Walewskaya. So they're they're in thin, essentially they're thin because of the Kosciuszko-Walewskaya. And this has been generalized uh, recently to domains that are other than torus. So the Bruno Lawrence was in a regular torus, uh, twisted domains and so forth by uh, Peralta Salas and collaborators. But still, it's done with Kosciuszko-Walewski and with current sheets in the plasma, which uh, um, it's dangerous, as we uh, know from, from fluids. So, I mean, it might be dangerous. I'm, I think I'm overstepping my, my knowledge about plasma at this point. So uh, the way to construct steady solutions, there, traditionally, there is a, a variational principle. Um, I don't know, uh, in the context of plasma, it definitely goes back to, to Kraskal, my predecessor. So he was uh, at PACM. So um, by Kraskal, and he was an advisor of uh, Robert Mackay, who is going to appear soon. So um, 
variational problems uh, with uh, various constraints, uh, which is very attractive and is still uh, doing things. So uh, you can do relaxations, uh, but those uh, provide you essentially weak solutions and uh, solutions with some uh, properties and you're not sure that you're gonna get um, what you really want in the end. The other method uh, goes by the, essentially reduces the problem to a scalar problem. This is not a scalar and uh, semi-linear elliptic scalar. And then that uh, there you have lots of tools. So that's about how we go to the scalar. So uh, what you want is a quasi-symmetry. I'm gonna define it here, but, and I'm gonna give you an example on the next uh, slide, but the typical examples will be simply what you normally know. So you can think the simplest one is this psi would be just uh, the Z direction if you want, and then psi would be a function only of X and Y, and that would be really very trivial, but and no confinement properties. So you assume, that you have the following properties. Suppose somebody gave you a B, divergence free B. And you are gonna say, uh, uh, this is for the purposes of this talk and uh, maybe some papers that we're gonna write, but it's uh, just the properties here. So uh, that the vector fixed psi is divergence free. And there is a flux function psi, such that this equation is uh, satisfied. And uh, there is another function C of the, psi, so C is a function of one variable that's smooth, so that B dot psi is C of psi. So these conditions uh, we shall call for a little while very weak quasi-symmetry. No assumption on B other than divergence free. So automatically you have that the level sets of psi are, so that, that uh, you can call this that psi is independent of C or that it's a symmetric with respect to C. Uh, in, if psi was a, would have been DDZ, uh, that would mean DDZ of psi is zero. And the same uh, that the level sets of uh, the B is tangent to level sets of psi. And in addition, also taking the curl of this thing, you have, uh, because both C and uh, B are divergence free, you have the, the, uh, this equation, which means that the vector field C and the vector field B dot grad commute. So these are uh, first conditions and only from these conditions you just uh, decompose uh, B and you write an ansatz or you write a consequence that B has to be of this form. So if you know psi and psi, you know B. And uh, so that's the very weak quasi-symmetry. In addition, we require a quasi-symmetry, a weak quasi-symmetry requires that B square is also independent of psi. So xi dot grad B square is zero. And the pressure that we're looking for in the equation is a function of psi. So though a whole bunch of uh, requests, I didn't say that we can satisfy them. I'm just saying, what is the definition of having such a symmetry, quasi, a weak quasi-symmetry? So <clears throat> the deformation tensor, which will uh, appear in the case of the Euclidean metric, the deformation tensor is simply like, um, before in fluids, the gradient psi plus gradient psi transpose. And the weak quasi-symmetry is the requirement equivalent because of the commutation. It's equivalent to the requirement that this matrix applied to the vector B is zero. Uh, sorry, 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 that this, uh, no, I, I have a typo here, that uh, this uh, matrix applied to B dotted into B is zero. And strong quasi-symmetry is the requirement that uh, the whole vector would be zero, C, sigma B is zero. So this uh, weak quasi-symmetry sigma B dot B is zero. So weak quasi-symmetry is being argued in physics for some reason that it is the zero order requirement for stability of plasma. So essentially, <clears throat> just for a second to explain what's going on, if you release hot plasma into a device in which you have a strong magnetic field, uh, to first order, the plasma particles gyrate along, they go uh, along the vector field B and have a small radius of a gyration. They gyrate around it very, very fast. And the radius of gyration is a small parameter. And you can imagine that you're expanding in that parameter and to first order in that parameter in order to have order one uh, stay inside the um, 
or the one in macroscopic time, which means very, very many rotation times, uh, to stay inside the device to follow the, the uh, particle following B, you have uh, this requirement, the sigma B dot B, this requirement, which is equivalent with sigma B dot B because you're weak quasi-symmetry. So weak quasi-symmetry is the first requirement. Without it, you are going to have uh, troubles. The, the plasma will go up. And there are many more requirements. Actually, Strong quasi-symmetry is perhaps not needed. And to some extent, uh, um, you'll see we have uh, some doubts about that. OK. So weak quasi-symmetry implies a generalized Gratia-Frano equation. So here's uh, McKay, who's a student of uh, well-known British mathematician. So um, there is a generalized Gratia-Frano equation for psi in terms of C, as you see, and it's a swirl function psi, uh, C. So prime is the derivative with respect to its own variable, which is called psi here. And this is uh, the pressure. So you have something that has a chance to be a semi-linear equation for the flux if you nuke psi. So you have a boundary condition that uh, the, uh, the torus uh, boundary psi needs to be constant, and then you are in great shape. So here is the thing that actually does work. So you do cylindrical coordinates, then uh, you take the azimuthal derivative. So this is um, a smooth vector field. It's, uh, you'll see in a second, it's uh, essentially the vector field uh, that is not, it's minus x2, comma x1, comma zero, okay? <clears throat> in in uh, um, Cartesian coordinate. So it's a smooth vector field and this is your uh, psi and then psi is a function that does not depend on uh, the azimuthal angle. Then you end up with a classical Gratia-Frano equation, which is a semi-linear uh, equation with these two functions completely free. You can choose them. And uh, this is the swirl, C is the swirl, and pi is the pressure. And uh, this is not really the Laplacian, Laplacian in zero dimension, if you want. It's a minus here. And this minus is not a type. So it's a, uh, the Gratia Franov operator. But nevertheless, it's a wonderful, splendid uh, semi linear equation, has nice solutions and all that. Note that this C is killing. Sigma It's a divergent. This uh, object uh, has no, um, no stretching of uh, uh, vector field. So a killing uh, vector field for the star, any metric generates an isometry. So if you follow um, the particle trajectories, the length of the tangent on particle trajectories doesn't change, the length with respect to whatever the metric it was. So in this particular case, this is killing. So the desire is to find a flux function psi with nested level sets and a quasi-symmetric MHS solution in a toroidal domain, whereby the quasi-symmetry is not killing for the standard metric. In other words, it is not really one of the, uh, how many are they, translations, rotations, and uh, of the, um, the space. So there is a conjecture by Grad before this whole program, but not before the, the Tokomak program, that the only smooth MHS solutions which have good flux functions, that means with nested level sets, uh, have only Euclidean symmetry. So C is killing. That's a conjecture that we uh, don't know uh, to prove, although uh, it should be true if you strengthen a little bit the, the assumption. So for instance, assume maybe even a strong quasi-symmetry. So we, we don't know how to prove this, but we can prove, however, quasi-symmetric MHS solution sustained by a small force. So in order to do that, let's explain a little bit what we do. So we consider a toroidal domain that is close to a standard torus. Standard torus, let's say with uh, um, thickness uh, uh, A, located uh, around, uh, so in the plane uh, R and Z with phi equals zero, it's rotated, uh, located at R zero and zero, the center of that thing. And A is much smaller than R0, I mean, it was smaller than R0 over four or something like that. Uh, you take a domain that's close to uh, the, the standard domain. So this object is swept by a rotation, by this C0 rotation, 
So if you fix phi, let's say you fix it at zero, and then you have a domain D zero, which is a disk, and you rotate that disk uh, with the axis of rotation, uh, the vertical axis, the Z axis, and then you get your torus. So instead of that, you take a domain that's close to D zero and a vector field uh, that in some sense will be close to this rotation. And in particular, uh, you assume that its orbits are periodic. They don't have to have the same period. And then you sweep, we say that the torus T is swept by Xi if you take uh, the images of these uh, trajectories. So you take the trajectories of the symmetry and you take up to the time that they turn back on themselves up to tau of P and you consider for all uh, P's in the um, standard dis deformed disk. And that creates a toroidal domain. And that's uh, what we're gonna construct. So the theorem is the following and uh, bear with me, it's a long, uh, description and I'll explain maybe a little bit why it is so long, why is it not entirely trivial. So <clears throat> you take a divergence free vector field close to the standard one and assuming it swe sweeps a toroidal domain T from D which is a simply connected domain close to D zero. So we just perturb. Now you assume also that there is a metric uh, in R3 close enough to the Euclidean metric and assume that C is killing for G. Okay, so you say, oh, a lot of assumption. Then there exists the flux function, then and the pressure and the magnetic field satisfying that it is, uh, psi is a good flux function for B, that's the statement. Uh, the nested, the level sets of psi, I didn't say that are uh, foliating the torus T. Uh, and there is the quasi-symmetry equation, this one, not the other one, and solving uh, the MHS equation plus a force. So it's sustained by a small force. And the force is not larger than the discrepancy that you have between your metric and the standard Euclidean metric, which is not here delta. So uh, C, if C is, in particular, this, this says that if C happened to be killing for delta, then there is no added force in this construction. So it's a okay natural construction. So first of all, the issue of designing metrics that are closed, we can do it in two ways. You can deform by some deformorphism, sorry for using the same letter as uh, before, close to the identity. And then you can uh, obtain uh, everything just by small deformation. Or you can circle average delta under a flow whose orbits are all periodic with the same period, let's say period one. You can take uh, the Euclidean metric and push it forward under the, the flow and average uh, in time between time zero to time one, and then you get a new metric. Uh, and then all, all, all the properties are there. So it's not a problem to produce these metrics and uh, killing fields for them. So the solution B is nearly quasi-symmetric. One of the equation is satisfied, the other is not. Uh, but the difference between it being satisfied and not is again of this order of the errors that you make uh, in the construction. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. And now I'm frozen again. Uh, I would like, okay, so it, uh, it's scared if I say stop share. So uh, the method of proof, I'm gonna explain the method of proof here. So you start with the uh, psi <coughs> in, in general. So let me criticize a little bit the generalized Grad Schiaffranov equation because I wrote for any psi, I wrote the Grad Schiaffranov equation assuming uh, the quasi-symmetry, but the coefficients. So the, the, the problem with that is that it has a certain ansatz automatically for B, but the divergence of B is not zero. And uh, the conditions that the divergence B is zero and this weak quasi-symmetry are complicated additional equations which must be satisfied. So it's a system, not a semi-linear elliptic equation, although the part that says uh, what psi satisfies is, but then there are these other conditions under which uh, the whole thing was derived. So moreover, the coefficients in the generalized uh, Gratschafran equations are not invariant under C. So it's not clear we can even solve uh, because they don't commute with C dot grad. So the uh, fix is the following. We take 
a killing matrix for a uh, for a uh, for a matrix a killing vector field for a matrix G, and then you do uh, obviously the deformation tensor corresponding to the matrix is zero. That's what killing means, and this results in the function that's defined by the ansatz that is the necessary ansatz turns out to be divergence free usual divergence. That's quite a luck, and then we solve. Uh, the grad Shafran, uh, the, the MHS in the metric. So all these things are modified to mean curl with respect to the metric and uh, cross product with respect to the metric. Turns out that this leads to a generalized, generalized G equation in which looks like the generalized grad Shafran of with coefficients having to do with G and with all the objects depending on G defined in correct way. So the coefficients, however, now are invariant under psi. So psi dot grad commute, so that this equation, which is the same, like see that grad, it's a product of uh, the proportional. This can be contained, uh, maintained. So in order to construct solutions, we deform a solution of the usual grad suffering of equation. We take a diffeomorphism from D0 to D, and uh, we seek uh, the solution of this thing by composition. This leads to a coupled elliptic system that can be solved. So we have uh, techniques for that and uh, it's not trivial, but it's now finally you end up with a elliptic system and in elliptic system, there is one principal part that's the equation that you're actually solving. You make uh, use of some uh, linear invertibility of the linearization and, and you're you are going home by, by standard method. So, once it's set up in this way, which is the correct way to set it up, it can be solved. One more slide. Uh, again, I'm gonna scare these guys, no. Coils. In reality, what people do, uh, they construct, they try to construct the domain T and they try to optimize it for a variety of properties, some of them very uh, uh, strange. And they want to do that by applying an external field, which is like a Beltrami field, which uh, obeys uh, the equation Jx, I, I lost my cursor, Jx cross Bx uh, is zero, which is uh, essentially Beltrami equation. So obviously it needs to obey this in the neighborhood of the domain that you are constructing, uh, but it can be singular at uh, the coils themselves. So it's, you can take a Biosa bar if you want. So we showed uh, with uh, recently with Dan and uh, Theo. Uh, Peter, we can't see your screen, okay? Oh, yeah. Oi, oi, oi. So uh, let me finish uh, by sharing again, and then I'll... I'll I'll finish, okay? So um, right. you see it, right? I'm not gonna maximize it because that creates problem. So we showed that if you are given, but we did this in 2D only. If you are given a domain with analytic boundary and an MHS solution, you can fix coils at infinity or far away such uh, that you can solve this problem. In other words, you can adjust the coils to match uh, any uh, given MHS solution, appropriate coils will do that. So there is plenty of solutions. So the problem here is that if you look at this system, it's overdetermined on the boundary. You have the no penetration condition and the continuity of the stresses, which in the case of this, because this guy doesn't have a pressure, uh, it says that the pressure has to uh, be a certain quantity on the boundary. This is overdetermined. And in general, if you don't put uh, outside coils, uh, you have theorems a la the theorem of uh, Serin that this can be done in 2D only in a, a disk. Um, but um, in general, you need analytic boundary conditions, and then you can create this uh, with uh, singular current sheets or not necessarily singular you can uh, modify them so then you can do this. So the statement is that there are lots of solutions that you can create uh, this way. So I'm sorry, I think I went over time. So that's all uh, I wanted to say.
All right. Uh, thank you, Peter, for, for your talk. Very nice. Uh, we really are uh, beyond time. So instead of opening for questions, I'll, I'll encourage everyone to go to the coffee room and ask your questions directly to Peter there. Uh, and uh, we'll reconvene here at uh, 11.20 uh, for uh, his talk. Okay.